yes. Hey, Nadia. Nadia Zold, director Hi, of Larry Flint for President. Thanks for uh, coming on board this year for the Tallahassee Film Festival, uh, where we will be showing your film on September 18th. Um, congrats on the film finally uh, coming to life uh, after uh, a year of pandemic and a delayed premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, I'm so fascinated by how this thing came together because it's, an, an, it's a found footage documentary, which meant that you came across all this amazing documentation, uh, what, 30 years after the fact? Yeah, it was, it was about 35. like 30, 33 when I started the project and then, yeah. yeah. So um, it actually uh, came about when I was doing this oral history with my uncle, who's a record producer, um, Steve Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And I was um, just curious about his life um, as uh, Leonard Cohen's producer. And I wanted, you know, some of like, the, the dirt on some of those stories. <laughs> and then he just mentioned like how he was Larry Flint's videographer during Larry's campaign for president. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I had never really, you know, I, I, I thought about Hustler sometimes just when I passed like the Hustler building, you know, <laughs> and it was in my neighborhood in LA, but I never really gave Larry Flint like a second thought until I heard these stories and then just like egged him on for, um, you know, more information and also like what happened to the tapes. Um, so the film actually um, originated because of this tape that oh, wow. uh, he recorded. Um, so it says the presidency spelled P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T. I am a candidate, Larry Flint. So Larry was looking for um, someone to record his mm -hmm. announcement for his run and also his platform. And uh, someone through his network contacted my uncle who recorded uh, his speech and uh, was so kind of taken by the, the fact that Larry's house had turned into this, this headquarters of um, kind of 60s rebel, like rebellious characters like um, Stokely Carmichael and Timothy Leary and um, Terry Southern. Um, so there was like this mix of uh, these cultural um, figures and also um, activists. And uh, my uncle said to Larry, you know, if, if nobody is shooting this, um, I, I would love to just mm -hmm. follow you around. And, um, and Larry agreed and uh, my uncle hired a crew and um, followed them for the short duration of the campaign, but also did lots of interviews. And, uh, and then um, went on to other things and the, the tapes just, um, stayed in his storage facility in the Valley for like 33 years before yeah. um, I digitized them. <laughs> so what went on in your head when you discovered all this? Was it just like, God damn, I gotta get onto this, make it a was, movie out of this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was clear that this was a story that hadn't been told before. Um, even though obviously there's the People versus Larry Flint, uh, they only make a very like just uh, glancing um, mention of his campaign. So this was really the story of Larry's campaign and that was like the launching pad into, you know, a little bit more of the story of his life, but the film isn't a biopic. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, um, it focuses on the most like fervent period of his life, which was um, like 1983 to 1987 when he won the Supreme Court case mm -hmm. against uh, Jerry Falwell. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because it, it's a reminder now that you know, back then access was a very different thing. And even though we have the omnipresence of cell phones and camera phones and this kind of almost surveillance reality that goes on now, um, doing this kind of documentary today seems like it would be very difficult. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I mean, with, with yeah. or, or maybe yeah. there just aren't that many people around like Larry Flint, unless it's Donald Trump. It's true. I mean, it's uh, he, he's kind of a one of a kind. He's one of a kind. Um, yeah. And uh, but I also think that his um, you know his showmanship and also um, his ideas just um, lended themselves 
really perfectly to um, someone following him around with the camera. So, um, I mean, I, th I think that uh, there are some interesting campaign documentaries out there, obviously. I mean, it's like, it's kind of almost his own genre sure. um, of film, um, just because it's uh, an interesting like window into the country and then also into some like larger than life characters. But um, there was, uh, I guess th there, there, was, there was a bit of more freedom then in, uh, in just people um, not feeling like they had to self-censor. And I don't think Larry Flint ever self-censored. <laughs> so um, the, the, just the copy that he was constantly oh, yeah. giving the camera was unfiltered. And um, in, in that way, it was really, it's really funny, most of it. Hmm. When it's not tragic. Yeah. I mean, what was it like? I mean, he's he's in the film um, briefly uh, before his death. What was it like meeting him and what, what was his, I mean, there's just a bit of him, but did he have any thoughts about the film or uh, where things were at these days? So he, when, when I first approached him, he had, uh, he, he, he said that he had really moved on from that period in his life. Sure, um, yeah. And he... I think it's, it was painful for him, especially with um, the death of his wife. So uh, he he just kind of was um, in a different spot, but he, I think he could tell that my interest was genuine and that I wasn't gonna do um, either a hack job or just like a kind of exploitative piece um, that I was gonna really um, delve into the characters. Um, and I mean, it, my, my initial reaction when I did uh, discover the the archive was that um, there was so much I didn't know. I mean, there was there was mm. so much about um, the characters like Madeline Murray O'Hare and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and these, uh, and, and Larry Flynn himself that I had, had no knowledge of. I mean, I, there was one period when I just like went through all of uh, Terry Southern's novels, um, including Blue Movie, which um, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, just, this terrific uh, window into like satirical 70s counterculture oh, sure. America that you know isn't that, that that book is probably never taught in school <laughs> so <laughs> um, and, and my first interview was actually with um, with uh, Paul Krasner who um, was the editor of uh, yeah, sure. publisher of The Realist and also um, he was the editor of um, uh, of How to Talk Dirty um, and Influence People um, by Lenny Bruce so um, it just kind of like opened up this world for me. And I think that Larry, uh, he saw that, he saw that I was interested in it um, from that perspective. Like this is fascinating American history. And so he gave me keys to the archive. I mean, he, he opened up his whole archive um, mm -hmm. and he had never done that before with a filmmaker. Wow. And he, he, gave, um, he gave his permission for me to use this footage. He, had never, he hadn't done that before. Mm -hmm. um, a few other filmmakers had approached my uncle um, knowing that this footage existed and Larry just wasn't interested in, um, in being involved at all. So he, uh, yeah, he was, he was very gracious. Um, and our, you know, our interview was, um, I mean, he, so how, what he thinks about today, I, I mean, he was really um, dismayed about uh, the direction the country was going at yeah. the time when I started the film. I mean, I started the film uh, right like when Trump announced his campaign for presidency, mm -hmm. and um, he, yeah, he, I think he, he, he thought pretty like soon after that this guy's going to win, and um, and yeah, Larry, Larry uh, Larry's politics are um, different from Trump's. So, yeah. Um, he he was he was a little bit morose about the state of affairs, but he was also. Um, you know, kind of just focusing on his casinos. <laughs> so you know. keep your eye on the money. Exactly. Um, although the funny thing to me was, and I think I mentioned it in, in a thing I wrote, was that you know he talks about he was going to be the first porno president, and in a way, I guess Trump was the first truly porno president. And there are other other kind of similarities in terms of you know the sort of populist thing you know like he's obviously the candidate of the coal miners that appear in the film and um he's kind of a you know that loose cannon vibe that i think trump played off on um and yet at the same time he's so not 
Trump at all. But but it was interesting to see this in a way as, as kind of a early tremor of, of things to come. I wondered what. Yeah, I think definitely uh, the same appeal that Trump had um, with people who just wanted to say, fuck you, motherfuckers, yeah. to the yeah. congressman um, and women. Uh, that that same like impulse um, is exactly what Larry was um, was running and why he was running too. So mm -hmm. he was. I mean, he's always been um, completely outside of the establishment. And uh, you know, while like uh, Playboy, uh, Play Playboy, you know, just uh, kind of catered to its advertisers, uh, Hustler never got national advertising dollars and just said fuck you to that by um <laughs> then making these wonderful ad parodies oh yeah kind yeah. of were like precursors to um a lot of like the kind of 90s culture of like um south park you know, and yeah and, and like anti-corporate um yeah. parodies so um he was doing that in the 70s when um he was you know just not embraced by um, by the mainstream, and I don't think he was ever really trying to become uh, this accepted, um, you know, figure. Kind of like Hefner yeah. was was always it was always like about the the aspirational man, like how to mix a cocktail and how to what well, what speakers you should get for your car. And also, this is the cute girl next door. Like Hustler was just not about that. It was like oh. showing everything. <laughs> and um, and Larry uh, was right in that people did pay more for a magazine. That sometimes it was like two hundred page glossy with like no advertisements like the only advertisements were like a few um Fake. back pages of oh. just like um you know phone sex lines and and sex toys and and larry actually owned all those companies so it was just like you know some just <laughs> promoting his own product um but yeah there's <clears throat> definitely similarities and i think that that was what interested me as well because um you know similarities in the um, the appeal and the people who um, who found Trump appealing and also who um, who were supporters of Larry's campaign. A lot of people yeah. in prison supported his campaign, and um, but then you know the the differences, uh, you know in 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 his politics and also in uh, his upbringing are pretty stark. I mean, he came from the second poorest county yeah, exactly. in the yeah. states, and um, you know he was he was never. Uh, you know, he was never given a leg up by his father. His his first memories of his father uh, chasing him with a shotgun, um, so <laughs> shooting at him and his mom with a shotgun. Sounds like some Harry Cruz level uh, madness. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, I guess, because now I don't know. I was at, what was it? I was watching. I was watching the Woodstock '99 documentary the other night, and it's like, um, obviously it was heinous, but there's also the all now, like they roll out all the Me Too commentary, um, reframing things, which, you know, were terrible. But um, I just wonder how you feel about that kind of uh, thing that we're getting into now with cancel culture. And then somebody like Larry, who clearly is, is so far outside, you know, any, any polite norm or any politically correct norm, um, and at the same time, is is challenging so many things that I think people, let's say, on the politically correct left, would agree that they would want to challenge too. I mean, it's sort of I wonder if uh, if that's a contradiction that's hard for some people to wrestle with, or what your thoughts are on that. I think that it is a contradiction that um, some people can't reconcile, um, and, uh, and 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 some people really can't get beyond um, beyond just the fact that he's a um, publisher of pornography. Yeah. Um, to like at least to, to be um, interested in what he did for um, for freedom of speech in the country. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I would say the decision versus like uh, Falwell um, versus Hustler. Um, was one of the two most important um, First Amendment decisions of the 20th century. That with um, like New York Times versus Sullivan, which is actually being going up for uh, for um, like Gorsuch wants to revisit it, and yeah, um, right, yeah. there's uh, you know there there are some other um, justices who 
are open to that. So that's scary to think that um, our libel laws are, um, you know, potentially under threat. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, so with Me Too, I mean, he, Larry's a difficult character and I don't think that I uh, felt like I needed to, um, to like support his, um, you know, everything about him to make a film about him. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and like an important thing uh, that I just like had to always remind myself of in the edit was um, that, you know, he, he really didn't, ha he didn't have to be likable. And even the things that, so I, I would included things that offended me that, um, you know, made me flinch that I would have liked to have like left on the cutting room floor, but the idea of like sanitizing Larry Flint was worse than oh, yeah. um, including yeah. that. So, I mean, him, uh, his outburst in the Supreme Court the, the first time around um, where, uh, you know, he, he says um, the C word, I was just like, I just hate it so much, but I, I was like, I have to have it in because um, it's okay to hate him sometimes, of course. I mean, you, you have to go along with the ride, but um, you know, it was, uh, it was more important to, to show him like uncensored than oh, of course, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's what um, I love about the documentary. I, I have, so, yeah, I, I have issue with it. And I think pornography yeah. is like a super loaded, complex uh, topic that I don't even like tackle. In my film. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, I feel like the, I mean, I, I know there, there are films that do tackle it, and just like in the ninety minutes we have, it just wasn't something that like I felt like I could like really like. Um, go into as like a, a big part of the film yeah um yeah. so obviously like the aesthetic and um like the aesthetic of the magazine we use and um we use like you know his profanity and everything too and so it's like you you get to you get to see what his home was like what his culture was like but um he you know that i think like we had like time to go into like a big discussion of um, of like the uh, the thorny issue that is pornography. Um, so well, I, think I that made the be... decision not to like not not to pursue that side of uh, like his battles with like Gloria Steinem mm -hmm. and um, Andrea Dworkin um, in order to just kind of like focus it on his battles with Jerry Falwell and also his campaign yeah. battles with like you can only uh, do so much Ronald Reagan. 90 minutes, so, I mean, yeah, it was um, it was a, it was tough because I felt like if I was making a series you know, it would definitely be a whole episode and I could treat it in a way where like, I, I it wouldn't just be cursory, yeah. but um, yeah, he's, he's a complex character. And I don't think that, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we uh, like lionize him too much. I hope we don't lionize him too well, much. Well, I think you just lay it out, you know, there it is. I mean, you can decide, let the viewer work it out. Yeah. There's no need to editorialize one way or the other because um, the, the materials there in in a great detail and abundance and it's just a matter of putting it together i guess but along those lines i mean what what kind of how much material did you have and how much did you have to how painful was it to chop? Uh, so we had um we had about a hundred hours of um mm -hmm. of archival footage and yeah there were some very painful sections of his life that you know hit the cutting room floor um i think like two come to mind specifically um one was actually the first scene that i cut that i cut to like um enter into certain labs and apply for grants and it was larry um recreating uh the motorcade on um jfk the, the 20th anniversary of jfk's assassination in playing jfk so like he, he basically landed um, at the same airfield and then took the same route with the same amount of like of limousines and uh, oh and then had somebody um, like light off fireworks um, <laughs> at the point where um, JFK was shot and then also have someone like throw ketchup at his face and he said, I've been a shot. Um, and then take him to the, to the hospital to where the nurses played along and like treated his wounds with a paper towel. Um, so, that, I mean, that was, it was, it was so weird and also like so irreverent and so mm. sacrilegious 
um, it was, it was and, and also it was visually fascinating too. I mean, the, the way that it was filmed um, was very like almost like 70s thriller. Um, but I, uh, and it just didn't fit in um, the continuum of the story. Like where that was happening, where that happened was like right before Larry went to prison and mm -hmm. there was so much already happening that like we, we, we cut it. Um, and then the other thing that we, we cut that um, I feel like is just like, is an, an incredibly important element of his biography um, is um, the information about his shooter. So um, Larry Flint was shot in 1978 um, by a uh, white supremacist, but it wasn't known at the time who shot him. And it wasn't known during his campaign for president who shot him. And so since I stayed within um, the timeline always of, um, you know, of what was known at the time, um, right. and we only see current day Larry Flint at the very end. Um, it's not like I'm like jumping back and forth between yeah. interviews with him. Um, and so I, I, it's like, all right, so we could either have something at the end of the film where we have the section where we, we say in a card um, who shot him or it's just not in the film. So that was really hard as well because, um, you know, the, the fact that he was shot by a white supremacist who was offended by um, this interracial spread in his magazine is, um, you know, it's, it's important information to his biography. But then, you know, the it was it important information to this particular film? Um, I don't know. It's <laughs> and I'm, I still I'm still like it's still a painful omission. Um, so yeah, there was there was a lot of footage, and then we did a lot of interviews, and um, we sourced a lot of other archives. So uh, you know, just kind of following um, the breadcrumbs of the journalists who were around, and mm -hmm. and then for my interviews, I. Um, I decided to only interview people who uh, had a direct relation to the story, like mm -hmm. people who lived or there at the time. Um, and so that eliminated um, certain really interesting talking heads who I would have liked to interview, but who weren't <laughs> there um, and would, would have only been able to like speculate or talk about Larry Flint um, as a kind of concept. Uh, mm -hmm. So, we didn't do that and um, we kind of just like stuck with uh, the timeline and um, you know whenever we could embraced uh, the archival and embraced telling the story through um, his own words or through the words of people who lived it as opposed to like news footage so it's not um, an archival documentary that is made up of uh, of like the the news clips of CNNs at the time and stuff mm -hmm. so um, it's uh, like a lot of you know it's first account mostly yeah, yeah, I think that's what's what's uh, very engaging about it. Well, um, so wrapping up, like, uh, would you say there are lessons we can learn from Larry Flint? Does he have a? Is there? Should we? So should someone be looking back at his example and um, carrying it forward in some way, like the good, the, the good, the good part? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, if if. Uh, people can watch the film and come away with um, an appreciation for, you know, kicking against the pricks. And, yeah. um, and then also uh, just being very aware of like when, you know, when, when we're self-censoring and to uh, be fearless. So it's, it's hard in this time when um, there is like more of an icy chill around um, just like speaking your mind come what may. Um, there wasn't the same amount of, uh, you know, repercussions. Yeah. But yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, punk anarchic uh, spirit is what I hope everyone takes away from the film. Great. Well, um, thanks so much. I'm going to stop the recording now, but we can. Okay. Cool. Yeah.